I think quite a few people have heard so many stories of Everest that I thought it might be interesting today to look at kind of some of the things that I've learned through the different expeditions I've done. I think when you go to Everest, one of the first things that happens is you have this weight of history. And you've got Ed Hillary here on the left in Tenzing. I think when I first met Ed, I was fortunate enough to meet him in New Zealand and got to be relatively good friends with him as he was told me about he carried he reckoned 65 pounds of weight up to the high camp before they went to the top he was an amazing climber probably one of the most most talented of the climbers on the team and he helped support some of our expeditions going over to the Kangsheng face and we had some amazing campsites up high up at about uh, 23,000 feet seven and a half thousand meters Paul Tier and I pitching the tent just on the far left you can see Makalu out on the horizon we moved up relatively quickly and Ed Webster took a picture of me on a very empty uh, face. You see Lotsi behind me, the South Coles directly behind. And we were climbing up uh, early in the morning as we went to the top of the peak. So the shot we really took after I came back from the South Summit and Stephen from the top was back down at the South Coles shot by Ed Webster. I think the thing about going back to Everest is quite an amazing journey up the valley with the Sherpa team that you're going to climb with, perhaps with some trekkers alongside. Last year, I hiked up with uh, my daughter, Phoebe. We went into base camp. We were there um, in 2003 with Borgia Olsklund, who's probably one of the world's greatest polar explorers, and he came up and climbed with us on Everest. I think when people get to base camp, one of the first thing they, they think is, oh my gosh, here I go. Am I fit enough to climb the mountain? And there's a fear of being strong, and you go up into the ice fall on the right, and I remember one of the first times I was there, somebody said, you know, Robert, I've, I've never done these ladders before. I'm really quite frightened. And I said, well, you know, I've been climbing for 30 years and I've never done a ladder on a climb either. So <laughs> join, join the group. There's not a lot of mountains in the world where you have to clamber up or down these ladders. But you go out into this amazing space. You're out there occasionally all on your own. Things are toppling down around you and you go up one day and you think it's okay. And then you go up the next day and everything is pretty much like falling off. And then you head back up the mountain again on another rotation. And this is when you get to go up to the Lotse face. You're straight off the Bergschrun and then you're straight up the hill. This is a shot taken a bit later in the expedition, so you've got some footsteps. But early on, it's pretty much brick hard ice. And this is when you start out in the morning and it's cold, then it gets hot. Then the wind blows, as you see here, coming off the top of Everest up above you. You arrive at Camp 3. It's oftentimes stormy and freezing. You have your choice of three locations in Camp 3. You could sleep in the top tent and have the avalanches coming down on you. You could sleep in the bottom tent, which is falling off the mountain, as you can see. You could sleep in the middle one, which is relatively flat and looks secure. But if you look below it, uh, that's where the crevasse is, and that's why it's a bit flatter there. So it's kind of your choice of evils when you get up to Camp 3. This is a, quite a unique shot. A year after I did Everest, I did Makalu. So this is a shot of Everest from the east looking west at uh, the mountain. The South Pole is just in between the clouds there. And the summit ridge, which you climb up to the top, is uh, on the right, just, just visible in front of the clouds there. Now, way up high, You've got uh, a couple of climbers just coming down off from the south summit, leaving the top. You can just see how big they are, just kind of get a sense of scale. And then down at the bottom on the left, a couple of climbers are headed up, and that's on the Geneva Spur. And you go up there and around the corner, and you're on the south coal. So you do that early in the morning. You arrive up at just under 8,000 meters, and you look up this face, and as you can see, Above us, this kind of mixed ground. You follow a track that goes out across the snow and ice here. Heads up, the line pretty much stops at the balcony, which is really about halfway to the summit. You get there in about four hours if your timing is right. And then you head off to the left and on up to the summit. So at this point, you've kind of faced your fears. You've put all that behind you. You know you're fit enough if you're South Coal. And at this point, it's a little bit about the face side of things. And it's not necessarily religious. It's more of a, do you have the belief in yourself that you can climb up through the night um, into the dawn the next morning and actually get to the top? If you're fortunate enough, when the sun comes up, you look out to the east and you can see Makalu. Um, and just stepping back, the sun comes up a bit further. 
and it kind of radiates the whole world. And it's perhaps one of the most beautiful sunrises in the world. It's, it's worth going up Everest just to see the sunrise from that summit ridge to the west. And you suddenly realize a small part of the world that you're on is suspended in the horizon. If you get a perfectly clear day like we did here, this triangle of Everest slowly grows in the horizon and becomes more and more prominent looking out there over the top of Nupsi and then on up. You go a bit higher and it's kind of settles down into the earth. You can just see the peaks of the Himalayas there. And the great thing about Everest is it doesn't disappoint. It's you do definitely feel like you're on top of the world. There's if you're not up there with with too many people, certainly it's some very fine climbing. There's uh, usually good conditions. The snow's not too deep. And you finally get to the south summit. And you look across at that summit ridge. And it's like, well, thank God it's not an easy walk up to the top because you got this amazing crest with uh, the southwest face on the left going down into Nepal and then on the east face on the right dropping down into Tibet. If you end up with um, something like this on the right, you go around people, um, you time it, you talk to people and you kind of work it out. So it's not as bad as uh, they might think sometimes. This is just a view literally right around the edge of the Hillary step looking out over to the west in Nepal, you can see the triangle of Everest is just faded right down onto the earth now as the sun starts to come up. As you move across there, over the top of the Hillary staff, this is myself and Sibu Sisu. Another shot here taken from Makalu, just to that summit ridge on Everest on the left. On the right is the North Ridge. And then on the left, you can just see uh, where we climbed up along the way, the summit and that whole top of the ridge is all kind of buried in cloud. This was at dawn, taken from Makalu just a year after I summited Everest. We can look across at this view. The final few steps right up to the top of the mountain, incredible cornices off to the right, dropping down the Kangsheng face. And then finally you climb up and you get to the top of the mountain. And David Han Hamilton, it was his first time there of his, of his 10 ascents that he made. And We've got this shot, which we sent off and uh, ran in all the papers in South Africa because Sibu was the first black African to summit Everest. But in reality, if you go to the next one, you feel more like this. And this is kind of the unretouched, slightly sideways view. I was up to the top and wandered around a bit and sat down and Sibu came up and joined me and kind of collapsed, <laughs> collapsed next to me. And we sat down and had a big hug and then David Hamilton, I'm sure, came up and said, this looks rather pathetic. You need to at least stand up. From the top, we see Makalu. And then on the left, perhaps even more interesting, you can see Kanchenjunga, the third highest peak in the world, which is probably, somebody will correct me, I'm sure, I don't know, give or take 100 miles away, somewhere out there in eastern uh, Nepal. You're an amazing view of all these peaks. So you finish these off, and then you start down again. And I think you've You've proved your fit, you've conquered your fears, and now is almost anything, perhaps one of the hardest parts is you really need to dig deep to get back off this mountain again safely. So you scramble back down over the summit ridge, and if you're still marginally awake, you're taking a few more pictures on the left, just shot around the uh, corner of the south summit, you see Makalu, and on the right, if you wonder why people love climbing uh, that Lhotse Kuar, you can see it very distinctly leading up to the top of uh, Lhotse. Just on the right side too, you also, at the very bottom of the picture in the center, you can just see the little dots of orange, and that's actually the camp. And you go down and down and down, and then you look, and it's about the same distance away. And you do that four or five times, and eventually you get back down. So that's kind of climbs of Everest taken over three expeditions that I've done. I think that importance when you go there, yes, you got to be fit, but first off, you got to really accept that this is a big, tall, dangerous mountain and it's not going to be easy. I think ultimately you have to be, be very fit to climb it. And then finally, you have to have really the faith in yourself to get up those final steps to the top. 